This video began as a write-up, as an extensive discussion looking at the watch, its technicalities, specifications, histories, narratives, influences. But I decided at the last minute to scrap it. All the information is in my head, but I wanted it to be more free-flowing. I wanted to look at this watch not only from a technical specification point of view, which we will do, but also look to the history of English watchmaking and the history of the longitude problem and how that's been interwoven into this watch and its story. As a designer, I love how narrative drives creation forward. And I think that's what not only creates more of an intimate product, but is so much more interesting to talk about. So that is the ultimate goal. Of course, we're also going to talk about the movement, separating the facts and the fiction. I can give you a more in-depth analysis about what this movement represents. Disclosure, this is not a paid review. Bremont is not paying me to talk about this watch, and I highly doubt they will let me keep a £20,000 watch, I'm guessing. This is going to be fun, and I also think it's going to be extensive, so pour yourself a drink, sit back, and enjoy. As most of us know, English and French watchmaking was seen as the pinnacle at one point in time. Of course, German watchmaking was just as good. And the old adage goes, as you become complacent, so you start outsourcing your work. And it so happened that English and French watchmakers started outsourcing their movement manufacturing to Switzerland. This was primarily because the Swiss had long, enduring winters, which meant that a lot of these manufacturers could stay indoors for longer periods of time and get to work. It wasn't too long until these Swiss manufacturers realized that they could create the movements equal or better than the English and French counterparts and decided to go their own way. And as the Swiss got more and more competent, so we started seeing manufacturers move to that side of the world and it became the creative hub. It was then seen as the pioneer in watch creation. More decades went by until the entire world was hit by what is now known as the quartz crisis. And from it, the demand for mechanical watches dwindled, favoring quartz and the microchip. Now, what's great and why I like telling the story is because I own one of the last watches ever made in Britain, you know, mass manufactured and entirely made here. And that's the Smith's W10. 1970, 1971, Smith's went bust. And with it, so British watch manufacturing finally ended. It is a sad story. And this is such a beautiful watch that represents that final swan song. So when Bremont arrived on the scene 20 years ago, their main mission, their goal was to bring manufacturing back to Britain. And let's be honest, everything is stacked against them. The Swiss industry is strong. The Japanese watchmaking industry is huge. Same with the German watch manufacturing industry. There is nothing on this side of the world in comparison. And if we look at it broadly from a business point of view, many of these companies are long established. We're talking 200, 300 years of history. They're a part of an umbrella group like the Swatch Group or LVMH, where Bremont, on the other hand, didn't have anything. They relied solely on marketing and on collaboration exercises to push their name forward. For those of us out there, we can understand how much manufacturing costs. Not just the machines, but the tool making, the employing, the research and development. It's extensive and it cannot be understated how much of a costly process it is, especially when you're starting from nowhere. I haven't followed Bremont's full history, but I can imagine the first 10 years was not only getting support and sponsorship, but also battling to create your own components in-house. The external parts, the cases, case backs, dials, batons, crowns. The first thing they achieved when bringing manufacturing back to this island was designing and manufacturing their own cases partnering with Martin Baker ejection seats and creating a case that is extremely shockproof. Now to the next part of the story, which is the history of longitude and the longitude problem. This is one story that is often glossed over. It's not spoken about extensively, but it's one of the most pioneering efforts that has changed the way we see the world. Not only was this huge milestone achieved by an Englishman, John Harrison, but he was a watchmaker. This is one of the first times when the watch truly changed the world. Instead of spending too much time talking about the Longitude problem, I will give you the brief bullet points, but I will also link the movie Longitude, made in 2000, starring Jeremy Irons and Michael Gambon, in the comments below. I highly recommend you watch it because it's so inspiring and it has to be one of the best movies for us as watch enthusiasts. By 1714, something called the Longitude Act was passed. Everyone knew how to determine latitude, judge the direction of the sun using a sextant to measure the angle. But longitude, on the other hand, was completely different. At the time, no one knew how to determine it accurately. So you could travel from east to west very easily, but without knowing your longitude, you could end up in Cuba or Cape Horn. 
I think to break it down very simply, without knowing longitude, you are lost. And at this time, there was debate about whether mapping lunar cycles or the phases of the moon was more effective than using time at sea, judging time. The concept of using a watch on a ship was well known for navigation, but the real issue was accuracy. This watch had to be within a second a day accurate. And that's because if you're traveling on a ship for 80 plus days and you lose accuracy of your watch, it deviates by five seconds per day, you're losing hours over the course of that time. And that means that your directions will be completely off. So the real issue was creating a watch that would be accurate enough to withstand the rigors, the temperature changes, pressure changes, the rocking of the ship at sea, while still remaining accurate and being able to keep excellent time. And this is essentially what John Harrison spent 40 to 50 years of his life trying to achieve, which he finally did. A handful of replicas of Harrison's watches were used by notable explorers who all gave them favorable results. And in essence, the longitude problem was solved, navigation for the world changed, and countless lives were saved at sea. With all that said, with all of that history covered, that is the narrative that went into the longitude. And I love that part of design. I love it when a story can perpetuate how the piece is made. Not only that this piece represents one of the first manufactured watches in Britain for a very long time, but also how that story interweaves into its narrative. Maybe it's just because I'm such a fan of the history that it really gets to me, but I find it special. Let's talk about the watch, its specifications, its details. This is number one of 75 and it's in white gold. It's 40 millimeters in diameter, has a lug length of 49 millimeters, has a lug width of 20 millimeters. And immediately when you look to the aesthetics of the piece, you can see that it is maritime inspired. It's using marine chronometers as its chief inspiration. As far as I know, Bremont has had more of an aviation vision behind their watches. So this is a slight deviation away from the brief. But we look to the crown and we see that it's a diamond crown, which is quite typical of an aviation watch. And I must say, it gives you this feeling of a navigator's watch with heat blued hands, the script and typeface used, the minute track used on the outside of the dial, very true of instruments, but also railroad tracks used on 1930s and 1940s watches. With the launch of this watch, Bremont also partnered with the Greenwich Observatory. If you look to the power reserve on the dial, this red circle actually represents the Greenwich time ball. And that's another whole kettle of fish we won't get into. This video is long enough already. But as you wind the watch, the white disappears and the red prevails. First impressions of this piece. Let's talk about the exterior first and then we can go to the movement. I am very taken with the triptych case construction. I think it has been masterfully done. This is obviously a result of many years of repetition. Three part construction with a rubber seal in the center. I find the flow of the lugs fascinating. Of course, inspired by an airplane prop, but the more I look at it, the more I see this streamlined 1930s feel to it as well. It's great flow. The lines are pure, and you can see that this has been meticulously drawn by hand. My favorite element is probably that polished chamfer on the very inside. On that alone, I think the externals are masterful. Things like when you put the watch down on a surface, it rests on its lugs. The case back doesn't touch the surface. We move to the dial of the watch, like I said, marine chronometer inspired. The one part that stands out to me the most, which I really appreciate, is that center component, which has been machined in such a way to represent the lines of longitude and how they wrap around the globe. The central red line that runs through the middle of the dial representing the Greenwich line and how it intersects with the power reserve, I like a lot too. The big date has been well framed and the entire script for the watch is superb. I believe it captures another time and also shows a good attention to detail. I guess my only reservation I have with the watch, and of course, if you're asking a designer this, I will want to inject something into it. I would have much preferred seeing Arabic numerals on the dial. And in fact, have created a rendition of using the numerals that they include on their Airco model. Not only are the Arabics beautiful, but I much prefer the vibrance that they offer to a dial instead of batons. But that's just me. I believe that the longitude line should stay after these limited edition pieces and it's something that should continue and evolve. It's too good of a name to leave behind. Something that surprised me is the fact that the crown is a screw down and this watch has 50 meters of water resistance. Something I should also mention is this watch comes on an alligator leather strap and the buckle and clasp is very well machined. There is an allocated portion on the underside that allows the leather to pass through without snagging on the buckle, which is a great feature. Let's get to the part we've all been waiting for and talk about the movement separating the storytelling from reality. If we go back to an earlier part of the video where I mentioned how they've achieved the manufacturing of their cases, their crowns, their external components, 
The manufacturing of a movement is something completely different, way more technical and way more expensive. Creating things like base plates, barrels, bridges is even worse. This is why it's so convenient to reach out to third-party manufacturers, get Swiss movements, Japanese movements sent over as batches. It's more cost-effective, it's cheaper to do, and this is what the majority of the industry does. The origin of the movement that's in this watch, very basically, THE+, which is a disruptive Swiss manufacturer, was quite perturbed when Swatch mentioned that they would be stopping ETA supplying of movements around the world. So they decided to go their own way and create their own movement, and it was called the K1. The long and short of it, <laughs> longitude, is that Bremont bought the intellectual property for the K1 movement which means that the brand owns the rights to manufacture the movement here. The net result is that it is a Swiss designed movement that is now being built in England. 50% of the movement is made in England, 80% of the movement has been modified or changed. Components now that Bremont manufactures, the base plate, barrel, balance, rotor, wheel bridges. Other bits and pieces are still being outsourced like silicone balance springs. I would imagine things like rubies and heat blued screws. The ENG 300 movement is being made in Britain to such an extent that COSC won't even accept the movement to be tested that side of the world because it's not Swiss, which means that they have to do their own in-house testing and regulating too. It's extensive and you see what I mean when I say cost builds and builds and builds. It's an extremely risky exercise, to say the least. And if we take a closer look at the movement, you can see the tungsten used on the rotor, the striping on the inside, the balance uses adjustable screws, the bridges have been well machined and evacuated, there's nothing better than skeletonized components. The entire mainspring housing has been covered by a plate, and I believe through the testing, this watch also receives the same treatment that many of their harder wearing pieces get too. Don't quote me on this, but I read somewhere that it has better shock resistance than your standard ETA movement, purely down to how the movement is assembled as well as how the triptych case factors into the equation. I'm sure most of you realize now that I have quite a passion and a drive for something like this. Call it patriotism, call it supporting the underdog. I think what you should take away from this video, not necessarily if you like the watch or not, but what it actually represents if you look at it deeper, if you pull back the layers. In a nutshell then, this watch represents the first major manufacturing of a watch movement in Britain in over 50 years. Beyond the design and the narrative that I'm drawn to, what does this watch signify? It shows you the result of a 20 year process. It shows you ambition. It shows you that this is not a cheap exercise, building small batch numbers of watches with a debut movement. It also shows you that this is not going to be an easy process and this is only the start of it. It might be 10 years or more before this kind of watch, this kind of movement reaches a phase and a production where it is affordable, where we can all get our hands on one. But it also shows us as watch snobs, as naysayers, that it can be done, that it's difficult to go up against your competition and it takes time. But I do feel very fortunate to have this opportunity to bring this watch forward to share what I think it represents and that hopefully we do see this continual success and the resurgence of watchmaking again in Britain. That was a long recording. That was like over two hours that you just heard condensed down. But I wanted to get that across. I wanted to talk more about narrative and story in this one because it's so fascinating. You know, a watch is just a watch without any kind of direction tied to it, you know. And yeah, some history there is good. What I've learned through this short experience with the watch, I've done a lot of research into it while preparing this video. I think a lot of the times we overlook how extensive it is to put something like this into production what it entails. The process is really extensive, not just when it comes to movement manufacture, I'm just talking about the external parts, the cases and everything else, that's bad enough. But when it comes to actually deciding to create your own base plates, machine all of those parts too, to be microns accurate, we're talking like between one and three microns, you have to be so on point with how everything comes together. It puts the large scale manufacturing of our general consumer goods to shame. Before I drone on too long, the voice is going hoarse. So thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I really feel fortunate to have this opportunity to present the watch, to be at that forefront. You know, if this is a thing that's going to be a part of the future, if we're going to see watchmaking become mainstream again in Britain, really excited. And maybe parting words I will leave, like this little anecdote that I've just thought about now. Nobody knew that this watch was going to be the last. Nobody knew that it was going to be anything but just a tool. And hindsight is always quite a thing. But it also shows us as knobs. <laughs> <laughs>